Great, good morning and uh, welcome. So you are in what at least I selfishly view as the most important panel uh, of the conference and that's really about the capital uh, and the importance of that and the financial community uh, to address climate change. Um, and we've got a great panel today. I mean, the, the topic is the role of the financial community in carbon markets. And with the three panelists, uh, we have a great cross-section of that financial community. So um, I'll just uh, introduce myself, and then I'll have the panelists introduce uh, themselves, uh, and then we'll get rolling. So um, I'm David Moffat, Managing Director uh, within Lancis Fund. Uh, we've invested in 40 projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions in North America. Uh, previous to that, I ran the carbon portfolio for Pacific Carbon Trust. Started my career uh, at the World Bank, and uh, for fun, I race uh, stand-up paddle boards on the uh, Pacific Ocean. So, great. And Luke, why don't you go next? Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, Luke Oliver. I run Climate Investments at Crane Shares, and uh, you might know us for our ETF KRBN, and you know, we're building out a whole suite of financial products, so hopefully relevant to this. And funny enough, I'm a bit of a paddleboarder myself uh, when, when, when I can. Yeah. So. Nice. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Vilas Kuchinad, I'm part of Bank of America's sustainable finance team. Uh, I'm leading our innovative structuring business, which um, uh, I will explain as non-renewables. Um, and so carbon markets falls into that, but also emerging technologies, uh, which are necessary to hit uh, decarbonization targets on the path to net zero. Um, I have no paddle boarding experience, <laughs> uh, but uh, I do like the ocean. <laughs> so, nice. I'm Andrew Westgate. Um, I'm an attorney at Latham and Watkins, and uh, for the last seven years, I've been almost exclusively uh, climate change focused. I do California cap and trade, LCFS, and carbon capture and sequestration. That's not incorrect in that at the end of the month, I will be joining Clear Sky, which is a, a hedge fund that's focused on uh, carbon and other climate-related investments, um, and they've been a client for about five or six years, so it's kind of a seamless transition for me, but I'm cool. happy to be here. And uh, I also enjoy paddle boarding occasionally, but claim no skill at it. <laughs> Good. Uh, so it's my privilege to uh, moderate today, and we'd love questions at any point. Um, we're going to take it with a lens of capital flows have increased. They massively need to increase to address climate change, to meet goals related to uh, the Paris Agreement. And because frankly, if there, there's no dollars, there's no impacts. There's been some great markets that have been structured for a while and no one's invested in them and they haven't moved anywhere. And that's very much changing now and it needs to accelerate. So, so four things we're gonna try and cover. Um, first is changes in growth in capital flows. A second, innovation in carbon markets. Third, touch on risks. And because this is a full service panel, uh, there's gonna be a bit on almost career advice in carbon and related finance. And that just comes from when we got together in the uh, preparatory session, I realized all three of the panelists um, have had new jobs in the past year. And so I wanna kind of frame that because there's, this, there's a dynamism in the space that I know some of the participants are, are interested from a personal level as well as a, a climate change perspective. So um, with that, uh, maybe just starting with Luke, because when I think of capital flows and what's happened and what needs to happen, I mean, Crane Shares is just such an interesting example, like ETFs related to carbon. I wouldn't have dreamed that up eight years ago. So love to hear kind of your perspective on that um, and what it means more broadly in terms of these markets. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, so the, the conversation around mm. what's finance's role mm. is it's absolutely critical to get funding and financing into these markets. Mm. You, you either completely regulate or you create a free market environment that incentivizes the right action. Mm. And so that's why finance plays such a powerful mm. role. I think what we did with KRBN and now, you know, KCCA for California, KEA for Europe, we have a global transition fund, which is global equities. What we're doing there is trying to create the products that just simplify all of this. Louder? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. 
I thought we had a question already. <laughs> so, what, what we're do, so just to recap, what we're doing with our, with our fund is almost democratizing everything that's going on at this conference and allowing almost anybody to go and buy exposure to California, exposure to the global carbon markets. We have an offset product we're hoping to launch soon. And so anyone, whether it's, and, and, our, and our investors are, are retail through to some of the largest institutions, and it's the fact that somebody coming into this market doesn't have to worry about kits accounts, they don't have to worry about understanding how these are created, where they're traded. They just go to the stock market where they go for everything else and they can buy this. And we've seen these flows, we've seen you know over a over billion dollars of flows into our funds last year with people doing exactly that. Some people are thinking about it as an inflation hedge. Some people are thinking about it um, as, a, as a, you know, they just want to be long. Some people see it as impact. And, um, and so we've, we've allowed people to do that in a very simple wrapper. Cool. Good. No, thank you. And uh, maybe, Vilas, if you could build on that, just having Bank of America in this space is kind of extraordinary given just the size, the global scope of the bank, and like what drew Bank of America into these markets and, and really why and, and where do you see things going? Sure, um, so I think you know, we, we've been active on the trading side um, in the compliance markets mm -hmm. for a long time and in the voluntary markets more recently. Um, but beyond that, you know, we've taken a very holistic approach to sustainability, so you know, last year, I think it was this time last year, actually in April, we came out with a revised sustainable finance target of $1.5 trillion, uh, which a trillion of that is in environmental transition, $500 billion in social inclusion. And when we think about you know, what that path looks like, not just for ourselves, but for our clients, right? Because at the end of the day, we are a client services focused organization, right? We facilitate um, transactions for our clients or financing for our clients. And when we think about it, you know, we think about, yes, there's renewables that need to be, uh, to grow further. We think about the emerging technologies that need to be uh, adopted and grown and scaled, and whether that's on, you know, kind of alternative sources of energy or whatnot. And, you know, we really mapped out, you know, okay, so what are the emerging technologies and what are the sectors that they're important to? And then we, when we thought about it, we said, well, you know, on this glide path that people are going to be on, on companies are going to take and governments, um, you know, there's going to be, one, there's going to be a portion that aren't going to be to, uh, able to be reduced or abated. Um, and, and what is the solution there? And frankly, it's offsets, right? It's, it's figuring out how to abate the, or offset those hard to abate uh, emissions. And so when we think about, you know, what service can we provide, you know, one of them is obviously on the trading side, right? We, you know, just, we have corporate clients who call us up and say, hey, you know, I have this amount of emissions this year that I want to offset that I'm not going to be able to reduce, and so can you help me do that? And we can act as a brokering, you know, and, and, and play that role. But beyond that, you know, when we're thinking about this, you know, you start digging into the numbers and you think about the gigatons that need to be removed over the next 30 years, um, or 20 you know, eight years, um, and you think about, you know, the scale of the carbon markets today and where they need to get to, uh, and, you know, there's all sorts of different projections, right? You know, I mean, I think every consultant and every kind of NGO has made a projection of, you know, the dollars that are necessary, the amount of removals that are necessary, um, but all of it, you know, you, it doesn't matter which one you kind of uh, align yourself with, it's more than today, and vastly more than today. And so we thought about thinking about catalyzing the carbon markets, right? And so one of the ways we can do that is bring capital, right? And so we think about the carbon markets, um, I guess, in two ways, or, or the voluntary markets, I should say, in two ways. And one way is, you know, engineered solutions, which um, are kind of at their very earliest stages. And so, you know, from a cost standpoint, need a lot of catalyzing dollars, but also from an impact standpoint, you know, from a dollars to impact, meaning, you know, carbon removals or carbon avoidance is less impactful today. And so on the nature-based side, you know, we're trying to bring that same sort of financing mentality uh, that we have around project finance to nature-based uh, projects, right? And, you know, like, you know, I, I always make a joke 
that you know, innovation is in the title of my job, but it's not very innovative for us to just say, like, hey, instead of a PPA in a renewables project, why can't we have a CPA, a carbon purchase agreement, and think of it the same way, right? And, and that, frankly, is how we've kind of started thinking about how to support nature-based projects. That's cool. Yeah, and I think that's a great, actually, segue um, really for Andrew and maybe more from your Latham Watkins lens, because I'm always a bit kind of jealous of law firms and just how much you know of what's happening in the market, what kind of deals are being structured. So your thoughts, maybe just building on that in terms of the clients at Latham on engineered solutions versus nature-based and how they're thinking about that, that kind of dynamic as well. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, initially I would, I would say that just the, the amount of interest we've seen in carbon credits of all types has mm -hmm. just exploded in the last mm -hmm. couple of years. When I started working on California Cap and Trade in 2014, it was only industry that was interested in it as a regulatory matter. We started getting our first uh, investment fund clients in 2016, 2017, um, and initially it would be sort of funds that already had a large pool of capital and they were looking to add carbon as an area of exposure. Mm -hmm. And in the last two years, not only have we seen the majority of, of new clients in that space that it's, it's kind of exploded, but mm -hmm. it's also folks who are looking to be only carbon shops mm -hmm. and to have this be the, the primary area of focus. So in terms of uh, nature-based removals or engineered re removals, I, I kind of put those into two categories. Uh, a lot of the folks who are who are in the market and have a lot of capital work are are already into the uh, the nature-based removals and the most of the voluntary market is that at this point, and I think the engineered removals are more of a kind of a startup concept from from our point of view. We're trying to help them get their toe into the market and develop the initial agreements that will let, allow them to develop and sell their offsets. Um, it, we're seeing a lot of uh, action in the CCS space, especially where. Yeah, you can combine LCFS credits and 45Q. I, I, I think there's a lot of interest in that in sort of abating the hardest to remove uh, parts of the carbon portfolio and that people are looking at nature-based removals for some of the, e uh, the easier to do tons at this point. Yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah, and maybe uh, Vilas, just kind of your further thoughts on kind of nature-based versus engineered and from even frankly from kind of a cash flow and risk perspective like where 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 is the bank placing capital where is it advising its clients to, to place capital because they're very different situations we know in terms of investments we, we make so yeah it, it, it's interesting because um, on the nature-based side while it's more established and I think people understand the risks around it from a financial institution standpoint, it's actually has some risks that are tougher to mitigate um, just by being nature-based, right? You know, we think about reforestation as, you know, kind of the, the primary removals, nature-based removals um, uh, pathway. And, you know, like the, the questions that we get from our internal risk and teams are like, well, what about, I mean, it's the obvious question, but it's like, what about wildfires? And what about floods? And, you know, what about, you know, uh, you know in, uh, other kind of uh, risks that aren't what we are used to taking, frankly, right? And, and so I do think that, you know, there's a lot of education that still has to happen around the space. And when you think about, you know, the buffer pools that the registries have, and you think about some of the other, I mean, there's insurance products that we've seen, um, I think a lot of that, you know, is helpful when you're thinking about nature base. Um, and, and then as you get, I think, deeper into understanding those risks, you realize that it is the much more developed, it's probably the safer pathway today and more established versus the, on the engineered side, you know, technology risk is not something that, you know, we, we're primarily a debt provider, right? We, we do tax equity as well into renewables, and so we'll do 45Q. But, you know, true technology risk is not something that, like, banks are used to taking, right? You know, really, you got VCs, clean tech, you know, kind of early stage investors, some PE. Um, and so that's a challenge, I think, right? Especially on these CCS uh, projects, right? Where at best you have pilot projects, um, maybe you have tiny, tiny commercialization, but really you're talking about proof of concept. And I think that's where, um, again, it's going to be really important to kind of build a consortium of uh, vested parties, right? So you've got the developers, you've got the off-takers, but in between, you know, are there ways to bring in, you know, 
you know, the insurance products? Are there ways to bring in government support or, you know, kind of um, multilateral development banks, right? We've been looking at a lot of that even on the nature-based side, but we're starting to think about that in, on the engineered side as well. Um, because you think about, you know, kind of where climate impact is the worst, it's actually in a lot of developing nations. And so a lot of our focus is also just, you know, we don't want to just do projects that benefit or are in developed markets and benefit developed markets. You know, we have a very, you know, kind of holistic view that we need to, you know, find solutions across geographies um, and, and uh, developing and developed markets. Good. Yeah, and just picking up, and I want Andrew to pick up on this, because I know that you've been involved in CCS quite a bit of it, and uh, hearing Vilas saying, well, you know, pilot projects, there's risks, there's challenges. Yeah, and it's digging into something, but I think it's digging into something that's important in terms of where capital is going in these markets. So we'll dig into it and kind of pull back, but I love your, your thoughts on, on CCS and what you're seeing clients doing and others. So. So, you know, we, we've seen a broad spectrum of clients who have significant emissions um, look at CCS, especially where there's access to a relatively pure CO2 stream. So I'm thinking ethanol, right. cement, uh, SMRs at refineries. That The cost of the capture and the dehydration and r removing the oxygen is, is really what drives the initial investment in the capture equipment and then, you know, the pipeline. So... Those are the upfront costs, and it, right now it seems to be all about finding the intersection in the graph where the credits that you can get and the hopefully a limited amount of pipeline that you have to build and you know, having the appropriate uh, underground pore space resources, that identifies a few space, places where it's, it's actually worth it to do now right. under the current okay. crediting systems. Yep. But, you know, as the costs drop uh, of CCS, more of those opportunities will open up, and at some point, sort of DAC is going to come down to meet it. Where, mm -hmm. you know, I think every injection well, which is permitted uh, for CCS under under 45Q or LCFS, is a potential DAC storage site mm -hmm. in the future. So, I think people are looking at that as well. Um, and the other thing I'd mention is uh, hubs are going to be our major point of focus. It's the it takes about, you know, maybe two years and a couple of million dollars to permit a class six well. Um, so that's a significant lead time. And, you know, the clock is ticking for 45Q. You mm -hmm. have to get your construction process uh, started w before 2024, and then you only have 12 years to, mm -hmm. to get these credits. So people are really looking for where they can do this. And the more you can scale it by connecting different sources that have the, the CO2 with the appropriate characteristics, that's when you can really drive the economies of scale and get something that's going to be financeable for the long term. Cool. Yeah. Have you less further thoughts on that? Or no, I, I yeah. mean, I agree. I mean, you know, there's always this, I think, um, tension between, hey, what's easy to do today versus what, you know, do we need to do to scale, which obviously I think um, it's not just point source, right? Mm -hmm. um, DAC is going to matter and some of the kind of other technologies. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, though, because on, on, on the point exactly of these wells have been very difficult, right? There's only a few of class six wells that have been approved. I think the EPA has gotten a little additional funding now that yep. um, will help speed that up. And um, But yes, being able to, you know, the projects that we've seen, like we've seen a Bex project that it works because there's all an existing well, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so you're like, okay, yeah. like that makes sense, right? Like developers thinking about using infrastructure that exists today so they can one, speed it up, but also mm -hmm. two, uh, they don't have the same costs in their project, right? It makes yeah. it work a lot better. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge that we're finding a little bit um, is on the the regulated credit side, meaning on LCFS and RINs, right? Um, you know, that's that's still a challenge, right? Because it's a very, I mean, the last year has shown us it's volatile. I mean, RINs right. have shown it for you know Forever. a long time, <laughs> um, and LCFS though has been you know fairly volatile over the last year, just with the the, the supply increasing and demand decreasing. You know, simple market principles, but um, you know I think. The other thing we've seen, actually, in some of the CCS, and it's changed over the last, I would say, two to three months, is I think with Build Back Better being out there, we saw a lot of people pull back on their projects and say, well, if it's going to $80, $85 for pure sequestration or to value, 
like we're not going to like that changes the amount of capital we're going to need. That changes right. the capital structure. Sorry, uh, that that we're going to um, have for our project. And now I think people have said, okay, wait. To your exact point, wait. We can't wait around because 2024 is a, a hard deadline. And you know, I mean, a lot of these have been extended over the time. But I think that we just in the last couple months have seen a lot more come to market or you know, kind of come in front of our. Yeah, it's caused a lot of negotiations of, you know, provisions to say what what happens if the credit value of 45Q goes up, is that split between the parties, uh, you know, how, how does that get arranged and, and change the, the agreement? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are significant regulatory roadblocks right now. I think there's two class wells permitted in the U.S. Um, so right now, if you want 45Q, the easiest thing is to, to do it in EOR because the, the wells are already permitted. Uh, but for LCFS, there hasn't been a single permanent certification issued, so nobody can be generating LCFS credits from CCS at this time. Right. Yeah, and Andrew, you're making the leap uh, from a law firm to, I guess, what I call a hedge fund that's very focused on carbon markets. So it's new capital, presumably some new investors coming in. So in that kind of big picture question of where is capital flowing and, and Luke's obviously from this ETF kind of fascinating angle, you have different investors and a different focus. And I'd love to hear kind of what that focus is. So, well, yeah. I think it depends on the investor. And, you know, there are definitely commingled funds where you have, you know, groups of investors who are looking for exposure to the car carbon market. And then there are other folks who are looking for advisory for you know a a single investment vehicle or a uh, or partnership, and you know it, it it all depends on on the client. Some folks want there's a lot of different strategies out there that people can be pursuing through carbon credits. I mean there's there's buy and hold strategies in general. You know we expect carbon prices to go up, and in California cap and trade there's a floor price, so there you can kind of model out what what that will be over time and your expectations about the price. Um, but people also want to trade more opportunistically. They can be using it as a hedge against some of their other risks. So I, I think there's a, there's a lot of uh, differences in what, in what investors are looking for. But it's, it's gotten to the point where I think every large investor thinks they should have, if not a carbon exposure component to their portfolio, it's something that they need to consider when they're looking at the risks of their portfolio. So that's just expanded the, the universe of folks who are looking for a carbon-focused advisor or people who have particular knowledge about the carbon markets. Right. And, and then for ClearSky in particular, like where are you guys placing capital? If you can discuss that a bit, maybe it's premature. So no pressure yeah, on that it, one. It but, might, it might yeah. be a bit okay. premature for yeah, a bit. But, you know, I mean, it, it's all carbon-focused and right. climate-focused. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. So maybe then transitioning kind of to the innovation piece and, uh, you know, with Crane, I mean, you have an EV ETF, right? And it's kind of, yeah. So what, there's just a lot of innovation going there. I'd love to hear about that uh, ETF and other ones that you're kind of, you're pushing because you, yep. you guys are doing this and other parties frankly aren't. Yeah. 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 And, and I'd even like to just go back yeah. a little bit on the, sure. the, the types of clients because mm. we've seen pure retail mm. and then we've seen, I mentioned institutions. What we haven't seen a yeah. ton of yet mm. is your classic wealth mm. management, which is the traditional okay. ETF buyer. But what's interesting about the, and I think it, it speaks to the type of clients, we're seeing traditional mm. institutions pensions, endowments, and so on, which often regarded as the smart money. And then what we've seen more of than I've ever seen in any other ETF, especially an ETF that's mm -hmm. a year and a half old, is the family offices, which often is the, I don't know if I'll offend anyone, but the smartest right. money, because right. they're not only looking for opportunity, but they're not encumbered by any particular objective, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's that they, they are just looking for alpha and they're looking for impact and they're happy to, to be aggressive on that. And that's where we've really seen these people. So I think that's, that's been really powerful. They're looking to support these markets. They're looking to get return from these markets, but, but ultimately they are looking for the, the, the impact. Um, as far as the other things we're looking at, so we have a cars, we have a global equity fund um, that, that's actively managed. Um, in, the, in the cars fund, we, we are... And CARS is the EV fund, right? Car, yeah, K, yep. CARS yeah. with a K right. is, is how we get along the, the EV right. industry. Yeah. Um, and and we, we, we're building out this climate suite. And we, so we see um, this, this whole theme of decarbonization. And we think about it in three ways. 
we think about it as you absolutely must be long the price of carbon. That's where we have our compliance market products today. We're looking to add a, an offsets product to that. Okay. Secondly, if you're long the rising price of carbon, that rising price of carbon is going to be the catalyst for huge capital flows mm -hmm. into decarbonizing you know, 20% of the globe. It's going to be the biggest capital cycle that's ever occurred. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be long those equities as well. And what we feel with, there's a barbell, cars, mm -hmm. you know, electrification, clean tech. We have a, another a fund, K Green, KGRNE, that focuses mainly on Chinese, but uh, Chinese green, green tech. That's the clean end of it. But where we think there's really going to be a huge amount of both economic upside, but that's where the capital expenditure is going to be, is maybe at the dirty end of the curve. So mm. we don't talk about, so we have this fund, KGHG, where we focus on companies like Fortescue. They're iron miners. They haven't been invested in. People don't like those in their ESG fund. But this is a company that's in the Australian desert mining iron ore. And what they're good at, are, and I think it's similar to, to, to some of the points um, that Villas made, is these companies are great at global infrastructure projects and distributing their product. Mm. They're in the desert in Australia. They have a lot of sun. They have a lot of wind. Mm. They're investing in renewables, and those renewables are there to power their main objective, which is to create green hydrogen mm. at scale. Mm. So that's a future leader of green energy mm. um, that gets them away from offsets, gets them away from um, compliance markets, and that's a completely undervalued company. So you've got this really interesting opportunity in the equity side as well. I see it as the other side of the coin. You want to be long carbon, and you want to be long the companies that are going to innovate as a result of that rising price of carbon. And the two things, we talk about, you know, I think you talked about technology risk. I talk about, it might be a similar thing, but I talk about innovation risk as one of the biggest risks to the price of carbon, is that people innovate more quickly than anticipated and get away from emitting. And it kind of then undercuts the demand for, for the offsets or the allowances. So you kind of want to be long both of these things because they are both moving presumably up and to the right, but they might be negatively correlated with one another as they, they do that. So it's a really right. interesting way. And then the third pillar, which we haven't actually implemented yet, is the natural resources that you might want to be long in doing that. So you talk about uh, electric vehicles, mm. you might also want to be long the copper, the lithium, the cobalt, mm. the nickel, the zinc, and, and everything mm. that goes into building a battery, building an electric vehicle. Yeah. So that's kind of how we think about it. And I think by having that package of products, we give investors mm. the ability to, to mm. be long these themes right. and also have, have impact by supporting those companies, supporting the price of carbon. Right. Okay, good, great. And with uh, Vilas, we have the director of innovative structuring. So. Dig into that in terms of structuring innovation and finance and, and what, you're, what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I'll actually piggyback off something mm -hmm. Luke said, which I think is right and very interesting, which mm -hmm. is, you know, we want to support the carbon markets because they're necessary, meaning offsets, credits, mm -hmm. because they're necessary. But at the same time, there is this tension because to have that innovation, you need to have a price of carbon that, that motivates people to innovate, right? Mm -hmm. And and makes it um, important for them to, to change their business dynamically from what it is today, mm -hmm. right? I think, you know, one of the things that we have seen or, you know, challenges that the carbon markets that we get feedback from our corporate clients is, um, you know, like, am I gonna be criticized for using mm -hmm. offsets, right? And, and I think, you know, there it's, it's you know, there's third parties, right? Obviously, SPTI has come out before COP and talked about, you know, removals, talked about 5 to 10%, you know. And so I think, you know, we find that when we're thinking about innovation, thinking about, you know, um, how to support our clients, it is a combination, right? And so it really is saying, like, yes, you know, this tension exists, but you need, like, it's going to take, you know, to your point, it's going to take five, ten years for some of these technologies to be deployed in scale. And so in that interim, you know, you, it, once you make that choice to make that investment because you understand that, like, this isn't a, a path forward for your business, you know, should you only invest in the technology solution or should you be also investing in offsetting portions of your emissions profile before you have that technology? Right, and so trying to think about ways in which we can support both, right, um, and and I think the interesting thing is, 
looking at more of these engineered projects that have offsets as a, another revenue stream, right? Because we've always thought about you know, a project finance having an offtake contract, right? It's like, what do they produce? And, or what does the project produce or, you know, and, and who buys it and who pays for it? Great. And, you know, that's how we think about project finance. Now we're thinking about, okay, wait, there are multiple revenue streams here, right? And so we don't need to just think about, hey, who's the off taker, right? Like on a PPA or, you know, who's the person or the credit that we need to think about. We need to think about what are these ancillary revenue sources and how do we combine this all into one financing package, right? And we think about a capital stack now that has, you know, not equity and debt, but it has potentially, because of tax credits, it has tax equity, yep. it has you know, cash equity, it has debt, and then it also has you know, a revenue stream off of offsets. And you know, if those uh, offsets, you know, depending on where things go with Article 6 and other things, you know, there might be a, a, a fairly known price, meaning you know, liquidity and transparency around them that you don't have today around a lot of just kind of you know, nature-based projects, which have a lot of variability. Um, and so I think combining all of that is where we see the next step in, you know, providing capital. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of complementarity between the, the technological solutions uh, for removals because, you know, they address a lot of the issues with the nature-based removals, which is additionality, leakage, permanence. I mean, th those are the questions when you have a, a forestry project or some of these new ocean-based ideas, I mean, is it, gonna, is it gonna stay removed? And then the flip side of that is the technological pieces usually have a much higher cost and right. they'll have to converge at some point. But it also creates a hard messaging uh, point for the public, which goes to the, the greenwashing question. You know, how do, how do we emphasize that off, offsetting, um, reduction-based offsets and other nature-based removals are really important now and we need to fund all of those things. But in 2050, like, we don't want anyone saying that I'm carbon neutral because I, I funded some cook stoves or, or forestry credits, you know, it's, uh, or, you know, avoided deforestation rather than actual removals. So I think that's a, I, I don't have a great solution for that, but that's something that we have to get across to the general public so that what, what we what the market eventually determines is the proper approach, which would involve mm -hmm. some of these uh, nature-based removals now, um, and then more permanent remo removals later, um, is is not viewed as greenwashing because that's what we want to encourage. We want to encourage people to fund cook stoves and Red Plus credits and these other things. Now it's it's really important, and if we lose that time, we're we're losing the climate battle. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, so, sorry, I, thank you. <laughs> uh, just real quick, I, and I think something you, you know, I said before about co-benefits, right? I think that's where they come in as well, right? Because when you think about some of these nature-based projects, you know, if there's also the co-benefit that it's bringing, you know, social benefits in areas that are underserved, whether it's you know in developed markets or developing markets, I think that's something that you know users can point to and that we evaluate when we're thinking about these projects. Um, you know, you know, we haven't talked about it, but B of A uses offsets, right, as well. We've been carbon neutral in our own operations since 2019, and part of that is using offsets. And, you know, we are thoughtful on how, where we're sourcing offsets, right? And so, you know, going forward, you know, I expect them to be removals, and, you know, I expect them to be in areas that we have a large footprint, right? Our own, you know, mm -hmm. kind of operations and, you know, just people, right? So um, most of that will be in the U.S., right? Just given we are, even though we're a global com company, you know, the majority of our employees in the U.S. So I think that's the type of thing that, like, when we're talking to mm -hmm. our clients, we, we try and emphasize, which is like, this isn't just a, you know, I, I've had this conversation before, like, there will still be clients who call up and say like, hey, I have $6, you know, per ton for my offset, what can you do, right? And, you know, then we take the step back and say, no, like, you need to be thoughtful, like, what are you trying to do? What are your business operations? And like, what are you trying to offset? And, you know, what's the future look like? And what's your glide path look like? And all of that. Um, and so I think those kind of are the conversations that need to be had, even with those buyers because they should be educated um, but you know I think that's a way to you know in the interim think about you know is it 
like what's the added benefit than just you know an yeah. avoidance? And co-benefits are important, and they're really only a feature of the voluntary market. Once something becomes a, a compliance offset, I, I mean, there still could be co-benefits, but I think it's just much when people think about those decisions, a compliance offset. This is a regulatory yeah. requirement. I just need to get the amount, and it's usually limited. Mm -hmm. So you know. It, it, there's not the concern about greenwashing, and with co-benefits, this is you know this is how these voluntary credits show the 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 real benefit above and beyond just the removal of a ton. Uh, it, it's funny, I mean, because this raises the big the big questions I think, which is um, when you, when you so my my view on it, and so the co-benefits maybe of the compliance market is that war chest that comes from the auction being put to. Good, good, good use. That's a great point. And, and that can create a co-benefit there. But, but I totally agree with you. I mean, my view on it is I actually wish, and this might be controversial, but I don't think it really is, we shouldn't need any offsets, right? The, we should, the compliance market should be able to create the fast enough innovation away from burning coal like cavemen and get to a point where we've got green hydrogen, fusion, all of these kind of panaceas that we haven't developed yet. But the reality is we're in such bad shape in avoiding climate change, we're going to need the offsets. We're going to absolutely need the offsets to bridge that gap until we can get to the point where rather than being net neutral, we're just gross not emitting. And so that, they're, they're the big questions. Are we, and, and I think you, that's a, such a great point, is do, do, should people be buying offsets in order to say they're carbon neutral today, or are they better off using that money to reduce their emissions and get to a, get to a point where they're gross neutral or, 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 or you know, zero, zero emissions? So it's, it's a really interesting thing because we, capital is going to flow into these solutions when there is upside on that capital, but ultimately the solution is none of these things existing. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a really strange... Yeah kind of paradigm. Yeah, it's a transition, there's no doubt. So, and, and those co-benefits are co-benefits because they're unpriced, which uh, maybe that evolves in some degree, but at uh, biodiversity credits haven't gotten far so far. So, <laughs> um, and, and just on the offset piece then, Luke, I think you mentioned that you're gonna be creating an offset fund. So, mm -hmm. I mean, how do you think about structuring it? You hear the tensions between engineered versus nature base. there's pricing, there's quality, like, Yep. Yeah, how do you put that together in, well, in kind of an ETF? Yeah, and exactly. there are limits to what yeah. you can do in an yeah. ETF wrapper. Um, and, and going back to kind of just fundamentally mm -hmm. what I'd love to happen if there weren't kind of the constraints of the 40 mm -hmm. Act and, and the way that you have to structure a mutual fund and an ETF. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think the nature base, so I think all the co-benefits, of course, we should mm -hmm. be, you know, I'd love to see the, the, the whale population mm -hmm. repopulated mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. 1850s. Or, mm -hmm. there's, there's so many mm -hmm. things I'd love to mm -hmm. see. Um, but the engineer, to your point, things that are going to lock carbon up for a thousand years, mm -hmm. things that can be put at the source of carbon, as you mentioned, that literally, like, that's as good as you're essentially not emitting at that point. And yeah. so um, those are the things that we really need to have the, the fast innovation on. So, um, but what we're doing, because I think this is really important as the, as, as the interim, is um, we, we're going to do what we did with KRBN. Where can we get liquidity and transparency in these markets? And, that is where the futures market comes in. And so if we structure an offsets product, it will be around like the, the, the natural base, you know, the NGOs the geo, the and the geo. geos. And right. maybe it's like a 80, yep. 20, 90, 10 split. So it'll be quite simply getting along that. But what mm -hmm. that does, as with anything else, you put money into that mm -hmm. fund, that mm -hmm. fund puts money to work mm -hmm. into the futures, the person going selling the futures to us has to go along the actual physical mm -hmm. offsets and you're creating that demand. And what that should create, because I think this is one of the issues um, that I'm hearing a lot at, at this conference is everyone thinks the price mm -hmm. will be higher, but you need that price discovery mm -hmm. to get the price there. Mm -hmm. And some people aren't willing mm -hmm. to put the money and wait 10 years or five years before that price discovery mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. So a product like mm -hmm. ours will start to bring money in in a very easy, mm -hmm. uh, user-friendly way mm -hmm. that will start to create mm -hmm. that price discovery. And mm -hmm. if people see that price discovery happening, mm -hmm. I think the bigger capital flows that might be mm -hmm. more institutional that don't even need our ETF will start to, yeah. to come. So I think that's how we help with that product. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. And on that kind of voluntary versus compliance market, um, I guess, Andrew, for your clients at Latham, it, like, where's the innovation happening on the financing side? Is it, is it on uh, really on that voluntary side because there's so much more happening now? It's so new or is it kind of both of them, are, you're seeing some innovation? I'm definitely seeing innovation in both mm -hmm. compliance and voluntary markets. I mean, I think people are 
looking at new investment structures. They're looking at ways to, to deploy leverage um, and, you know, just new ways to attract additional investors and, and bring folks who otherwise might have been scared away by certain regulatory mm. aspects of the, the system mm. to, to get this exposure. Mm. Um, so I, th I think that's, that's a big part of it. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, that's good. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just checking in terms of any questions, I think feel free just to, to bring them up. It's a good panel. It's the only one on finance. Uh, so you may have questions just bubble up. And uh, I don't know, we're here for another 20 minutes or so to uh, answer them as you have them. Um, and ah, we have one. Go for it. Good question, right. Yep. 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 Yeah, there's, I think there's maybe three parts to that, and they're all things we think about a lot. We get questions like that a lot from our investors. So the first one is we, we, we are, um, you know, liquidity is a big concern for us. Uh, the ability to hold a position and carry a position and worry about what that costs to carry a position over time. And we, we've spent a lot of time with the regulators getting comfortable with the products to launch them. So KRBN was probably two years in the making before it actually um, came to market. And it was interesting because the markets traded about 165 billion a year at the time of coming to market, but that's already 680 billion. Right. And, uh, and, and, and I, I mentioned that for a couple of reasons, one, one being that the market's grown dramatically, the other one being that the, the fund, as big as KRBN is, and it gets, we, we get a lot of attention for, for being this, this big fund in the market, the tail's not wagging the dog. Us, the people have said, oh, well, when you trade, you move the market. We don't. We're, we're, we're a very small part of the market. And even where we are a larger part, like the Reggie market, we're still not materially a factor in what's happening in the Reggie market. You know, when we rebalanced, we went from 6.8% down to 5% at mm -hmm. the last rebalance. And we had people, expect, it was like, oh, KRBN's dumping Reggie's. No, we're doing a rebalance. And it's, mm -hmm. we, we've got, you know, we're working with various brokers to, to manage that. And it, it had very little effect on, on, on the price, if any. Um, the other key point, well, so, so um, you asked about how we talk to the regulators and how we talk to the, the um, maybe the programs themselves. So Reggie's the, the, the one that we've kind of kept in touch with the most because it's the smallest of the four markets and we're um, you know, the largest portion of open interest in that market. But again, just like ETFs with futures, they're not limited. It's not like the stock of a company. If you want a million shares and there's only two million shares in existence, you, you're buying half of them. How are you going to do that? With, an, with a future and an ETF, if you want more shares or more futures contracts than exist, that's not a problem provided the bank behind it can source what's underneath the future and deliver that, and then they can put the position on. So um, we do keep close to making sure we're in touch with those regulators on how big we are in the futures market. We are uh, regulate. The reason we haven't got a European usage fund is for exactly this reason. They were waiting to hear from uh, the ESMA report that just came out that said speculators are a very small part of the market right. and are not driving the market. And they mentioned there was, there was one big international fund, and I, I think... I think they were talking about us, and still kind of irrelevant to this, this mm. size of the European market. So we're hoping to be able to get a European product to market based on, um, on that outcome. And then the very last piece is that carry. And you look at, look at California's, like the, so in Europe, the carry of a fu the futures is, is negligible. It's about 60 basis points over a year. It could be range 60, 80, give or take. Mm. California has got this 500 basis point carry. So the idea being is if you hold California futures, it's costing you 5%. Now, it, it's that, if that's the only way to get it, then that just becomes, like we don't lag our index by 5% because the index is based on futures, which builds in the same thing. But that's kind of interesting. People debate it a lot. If you want to get physical California, you have this, you know, I think it's 10.5 million tons you're, you're capped at. Yeah. So people selling products that give you the physical charge you a premium for the fact that they're getting you the physical. And all the analysis we've done is that in the futures, you have this implied 5% carry, and we're charging 78 basis points to give you that, or you can 
pay 1% or 1.5% and 15% incentive on the, on the upside in the physical product. So if you get any of the performance that you're sort of expecting to get over the next couple of years in California, you'd end up paying more in the, in the performance fee. So where, where I go with that is, I, and, and the other little catch that you don't always hear about is usually the people buying the physical are putting on the futures in the near month. And if they're buying today, they're going to buy the June, you're going to get three months. You're going to get a quarter of that 500 basis points built in anyway. So it's, it's a little bit, so essentially, and I know I'm taking a long time with this answer, but the California, the 500 basis points, I don't get hung up on that at all because that's the way to get exposure. And if you compare it to someone giving physical but having higher costs, they kind of cancel out. And then when you, when you cancel that cost piece out, you're left with one's less liquid, one's highly liquid. And so I always go for the liquid transparent version if the cost is about the same. So that's where I get very comfortable that uh, the fact that we're, we're giving futures exposure isn't, isn't a negative. I actually think it's, it's a benefit. It's cost right. equalized the same and much more liquid. Good, thanks Raymond. Good to see you as well. So, great, yeah. Good, thank you. Yeah, who's on top of that? It's not uh, our. I'll, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll start. Um, I, I will disclaim it with I'm not on the capital market side of our business who are doing this every day, so um, I will be brief. But look, I, I mean, I think, you know, they play an important role, obviously, um, in terms of uh, capital allocation, right? Um, you know, is the discount huge? No, um, you know, for, for issuers. But I think it's the, the fact that, you know, a large amount of capital wants to be allocated to what is seen as green or, you know, sustainable linked or sustainable linked loans or bonds. Um, I think you, you mentioned Fortescue. Um, you know, they're coming out with a large green bond to help fund part of this transition or their FFI is their kind of uh, part of the business that they're doing the hydrogen uh, uh, production in. And, and the renewables around that. So, you know, that is a way to access, you know, both the, the capital markets in a way that, you know, you may not be able to in uh, like a project finance or a project bond. Um, and, and then the second thing on the taxonomy, I mean, we follow it ourselves, obviously, because we think about, you know, we define sustainable finance as, you know, meeting the 17 SDG, UN SDGs, right? That's the simplest way for us, and so we think about it. You know, we have been following, you, you mentioned the EU taxonomy, right? Like gas and nuclear are something that's become, contra I, I don't want to say controversial, but there's, there's pushback by different um, sectors and uh, different interested parties. And, you know, obviously, you know, the, the terrible things going on in Ukraine have, have driven some of that, but even before that, you know, I think the, that taxonomy was coming in. I, I mean, taxonomy will drive capital at the end of the day, is, is my point, though. Um, you know, and so I think that's why there is pushback, because, again, just like we've been talking here, you know, there is this tension between, is this the transition? Like, wh what should the transition look like, right? And so if we're supporting these industries that we don't think will necessarily be there at 20, in 2050, should we be including them today? Because does that extend their life and slow down innovation and you know, slow down the transition? Um, but you know, faced with the other side of it, which is, you know, there is, you, know, you look at how the compliance markets works, right? Like e EUAs you know, make sure that the cost doesn't go too high because it has an impact on consumers, right, and users. And so I think, you know, from a taxonomy standpoint, you know, it, it, I don't know what the right answer is by far, um, but I will just say that, you know, it will drive capital flows. Yeah, green bonds has been a topic that uh, we've talked about over a number of years at Latham, but personally I've, ne I've never seen a, a big surge in activity in that sector. I mean, granted, some of it would, would have come to my capital markets colleagues rather than me, but, uh, you know, I, my own feeling is that it's part of the, the green category, like ESG, is somewhat squishier and, and broader than just carbon-based. And I think from an investment perspective, it's kind of easier to, to live in the carbon world where everything can come down to like a CI score or metric tons of CO2E, and it's, it's easier to compare apples to apples in that way. 
but it, you know, I, I think it could be an important part of the market. It's just uh, in my corner of the, the legal world, it hasn't uh, made a big ripple. Yeah, good. Great. I want to spend a couple minutes on risk and maybe start with a question to the audience. And uh, who was in carbon markets uh, when Waxman Markey didn't make it to the Senate, when uh, the CDM imploded? Who was around 2011, 2012? Okay, so not so many. And what's interesting as well is none of the panelists were. And, and just kind of a, I guess, a question to the panelists as you think about big risks in these markets. And uh, I mean, one of the things I love about kind of working with law firms and, and putting together contracts is they try and really clip many of these risks in the contracts. So just putting out to all three of you, how do you think about the risks in these markets now and, and how are you kind of managing them? I mean, I, 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 one, one thing that I've found, it just, it, it might be my, my um, sample size is it wasn't big enough at the conference, but one thing I, I've, everyone is on the assumption that offset prices will be significantly higher in the future. And it's not, it's not a bad assumption, but if we had massive breakthroughs in the, the engineered solutions, then that would have a, a big impact. And so, and quite, when I say that to people, quite a lot of people will look at me and go, but no, the demand is gonna be so much greater. They have to be, and that's okay, but funny enough, so by not being in the carbon industry since 2013, having been in commodities, which being long commodities means you're going short human innovation. You're saying, oh, this thing's gonna be rare and increasingly rare, and humans are good at growing more stuff mining stuff more efficiently, getting away. That, I mean, that, we're relying on that innovation to solve this, this problem. So, and I've seen this, and, and I, was in, I was in foreign exchange derivatives when, huh. when you know, Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers went out of business, and that was all based around derivatives. And so things that, you know, pe you know mm. we, we had the big, uh, 2015, we had that big Volmageddon spike where everyone said, well, if you sell vol, that's free mm. money. You, you can mm. sell vol, you're, you're the insurance company now, until... Mm there's a, a massive spike in volatility and you're completely wiped out. So where I'm going with this is, I, I think that's being underappreciated that there is risk that just because this feels like it should go up and we all really want it to go up, that, that it will be, will be that. And that's why I think that, um, I think that's what finance can actually bring in, that there's a risk management element that's really important. And um, we don't know, I, I don't have all the answers for, for how to do that, but I think people just, just be, be eyes open to the fact that the thing that, feels like a no-brainer, right. isn't always right. uh, so. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, good. Right. I mean, I think credit quality and the you know, realness and permanence of reductions is always a risk. Um, in, the, in the compliance markets, at least, there's the invalidation mechanism to somewhat address that. And when we write contracts, you know, there's typically some kind of indemnity for, for invalidation. Mm -hmm. Although that's a limited period and, you know, in, invalidation hasn't, there haven't been that many invalidations, at least in California. So. It's not clear what, what role that plays, but I think in the voluntary market it tends to be, you know, all the, the risk of the credit quality is on the buyer, and it's not clear how that's going to actually shape out, right? If a, if a credit was retired 10 years ago, and then we discover that this particular type of credit, the protocol doesn't really hold water, it's, it's not very permanent, what, what happens to that company? It's perhaps a reputational risk, but there's not some clear way that that will be addressed. And I think there's kind of two things we need to do on the, on the quality side. One, you know, we need to have these market standards evolve over time for what are the like real permanent reductions, uh, removals that can be used in 2050 and onward that we, that we think really do represent a ton of carbon removed from the, at from the atmosphere. And if we don't coalesce, coalesce along uh, around those standards and have them implement and, and be stricter over time, I think we're going to, the industry is going to be accused of greenwashing and it's, it's going to lose credibility and then that can be a risk to the appreciation of offsets. I think conversely, there's a risk that, you know, we have these other offsets which are uh, based on, on reductions and not removals. They may, may not be as additional as we would like. And I think there's a risk that if we cut all of that activity off too soon or too abruptly, that it affects the confidence in the other markets going forward that, you know, if you have something a little off in your protocol, you, you only generated 90% of the reductions that you thought you would, um, that your credits are going to be worthless. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we need to look at both the, the top and the bottom of the spectrum and kind of keep those 
both converging and, and everything in the mix because we do need an all of the above solution. And if we damage the you know, credibility of carbon markets, that can affect our ability to implement that solution. Good, and I, I know I, uh, I promised a full service panel and we got five minutes, so I wanna transition now just on the, the career advice <laughs> part of it, just with all three of the, uh, of the panelists having shifted positions or in the process of doing it over the past year. And they're, they're betting their careers in this space um, as well as investing theirs and other people's money. So I, I just love to get kind of the, the perspective on why you made the jumps you did. Um, and Andrew, you're, you're right in the middle of a jump and it's from a law firm to a hedge fund and, you know, focusing in, on carbon markets. So yeah, that, that's a that's a leap. Why uh, why'd you make it? Uh, well, you know, so I, I started doing this kind of work in like 2014, 2015, and at the time it was it was very interesting and it intellectually stimulating, but I, I didn't think of it as like a career path. I thought, you know, I'd, I'd do, end up in some more traditional space. And now we're at the time where, you know, people can be full-time climate. I'm, basically nothing I do at Latham uh, is not related to climate change in some way. So that that's that can be your career as a lawyer. As far as moving to the business side, uh, it was just, you know, I'd never felt such a, a synergy between the skills that I have and like what's going on in the world and the opportunities that, uh, that there are. And I, I thought I wanted to at least dip my toe in the, mm -hmm. in the business side and try that out and uh, that I would regret it if I didn't. But I just think, you know, between the, the timing of the, the energy transition and like where I am in my career, it's like Kyoto was uh, 1990 when I was nine years old and then in 2050 I'll be 70. So this is, this is really taking place during my time. We're either gonna make it or we're not uh, during my working life. So this can be something that you know, I dedicate my life to and I can, I can do it as a lawyer, I can do it at a hedge fund, I could do it at a, at a nonprofit at some point, but it, you know, it's something that I feel good about working on and that I, I just think there's, you know, limitless opportunity. Right. Cool, and maybe uh, Luke, because you've done so many different things and different products in, in finance and decided to make the leap to, to Crane Shares about a year ago and, and focus on carbon and, and just, you had a lot of other opportunities, I'm sure, so why? Yeah, well, no. Andrew's, Andrew's mm. point's really, really true. I mean, my, my um, I've been fortunate that I've often been in some of the right places at the right time, which I think, you know, by design, you're always mm. trying to find those, those things. I mentioned commodities. And, you know, I was in a foreign exchange boom, then I was in a commodity super cycle, mm. then I got into the ETF boom, and then now marrying ETFs with I, this climate, climate movement. Yeah. But it's, mm. and, it, and this, this kind of will go back to what Andrew said, it's, it's what you can be passionate mm. about, and it's, it's important. And I think that this isn't a market purely to, I'm very comfortable mm. making money and mm. making money for investors in this market, but it has to be about mm. solving the problem. And if you're passionate about that, mm. I think the money comes mm. along, uh, mm. you know, the, the, the career mm. will, will come out of mm. that. If we start with the passion to actually, within mm. our lifetime, solve mm. this problem, mm. we have to solve it in, mm. within our lifetimes. Mm. Right, good, and uh, ending with you then, Viras, in terms of your uh, transition to uh, sure. U of A. And I think I probably made the smallest transition. I was at another bank, and um, but I was more broadly focused on infra and energy, um, you know, and and I think it goes back to something everybody said, and it it it's impact, right? Um, you know, when when thinking about the things that I was working on. Um, you know, and this is not meant to disparage the work, right? I think, you know, whether it was derivative business or financial engineering, or, right? Like it was solving a problem for a client that had that problem, right? And, and so at the end of the day, that's important. And, but for me personally, it's very much what Andrew said, you know, like this is, you know, like our generation is basically been tasked with this. And, you know, at this point in my career, I've had enough experience where I feel confident that, you know, I, I know what I like doing, what I don't like doing, and you know, I know where that things that I can personally be passionate about make me better at my job, right? That that's just a um, a given, at least for me now. Um, and then, you know, not to sound corny, but you know, like I have small children, and it it was less maybe thinking about you know their future candidly, and more just them asking me what I do, and you know, not being able to describe it. Um, sometimes was like 
well, like, what am I doing? Um, <laughs> and now being very easily able to describe it, you know, um, in ways that, you know, kind of, you know, young children, um, elementary school children can understand. And, and, you know, frankly, the amount that they know actually at a very young age is very surprising to me because I did not have that, you know, kind of, I think we're all kind of same generation, like growing up. And so, um, you know, that was a little bit of inspiration too. Um, and then the last point I'll just say is I, I, I had this conversation with my wife, which was like, you know, I'm kind of making a bet that, you know, sustainable finance is something for the long haul because like in for an energy, you know, you're kind of always going to have to build infrastructure out, whatever. And, and you know, the, she, she asked me what I thought, you know, like I kind of posed the question. There. And I said, I think sustainable finance will not be something five, ten years from now because everything will be sustainable finance, right? Like that's just the, the, the way things are going. Nobody will think about deploying capital without thinking about the impact it has on climate, on the environment. And so, you know, being able to be early to it, I think, you know, uh, matters. Good. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great way to conclude and just uh, uh, thank the panelists, if you will. And if you have further questions, I'm sure folks can stick around for a few minutes, but really appreciate getting the time with the three of you. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks.